Now we not only have the column of Trajan, but of course, as discussed, we have the markets of Trajan, which is basically an ancient Roman mall. This is a series of shops and administrative offices, and the whole thing is built of concrete. And as we go inside of it, sort of looking at today, we see this structure on the left. You see this structure was as much as five stories tall. And when you go inside, it was much like your classic mall of today. You notice the ceiling is a giant barrel vault and everything is set up in a series of arches. That's a very Roman image right there. The Romans using the concrete and the arch, two technologies they are most known for. And this barrel vault creates a massive open space underneath. And then here we would have our various shops. For example, you might have a fabric shop next to maybe a, uh, someone selling foodstuffs next to maybe an administrative office, all in one massive building. Whereas the forum was not one building. It was actually a collection of small buildings all in one general space. So this was a vast improvement. And with these multiple levels and multiple stories, uh, it's a very complex layout. Had you seen it while it was active, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and a modern shopping mall today. It actually does everything a mall is supposed to do. It becomes the center of civic activity, bringing everything into an efficient space. Now, following on to that, we have the Pantheon, which is built by Hadrian, Trajan's chosen successor. And Hadrian was known as a lover for lover of art, literature, and Greek culture. Consequently, we have this temple that looks both Greek and uniquely Roman. And this is a temple to all the gods. So when we look at it, you'll notice it's round. And it's actually a temple to a series of gods, but it's representational. Sort of like King Arthur and his round table. There's no head of the table. So here there's no chief god being depicted. They're all being equally worshipped by this space. And this is an incredibly influential structure. Keep in mind, this dome that we're looking at is approximately 1900 years old and it's a concrete dome. It's the largest dome in the Christian world in the West. And it's incredibly influential on the Renaissance when you deal with places like the Duomo or St. Peter's in Rome or even in the United States. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello is based on this dome. Now, the whole thing is concrete. And you see from this elevation on the right that the lower level, we have cement mixed with uh, tuff or a volcanic stone and some other heavier fill. So when you look at someone pouring concrete, you'll notice there's stones known as aggregate and then there's cement in between. So what we're looking at is what is in those stones, what's in the fill along with the concrete. As we move up, we see it's tuff, so the volcanic stone mixed with broken tile. Now broken tile is ceramic, so it's going to be a little bit lighter. Then we move to cement mixed with broken bricks. Now the broken bricks, again, are lighter than the preceding materials. As we move up, uh, we end up with concrete mixed with basically pumice, or the lightest volcanic stone you can think of. The, and pumice actually is so light it floats. It's not only good for rubbing the calluses off of your feet. And the reason for that is they want the lightest material at the top so that that dome will last as long as possible. We also see this Greek facade on the structure, uh, Greek or Etruscan, and it would have been originally elevated above street level, although today it's at street level and the back of it's actually about 10 feet below street level. And that's because the city of Rome has 
literally risen over the centuries around it because of rubble. A building falls down. You don't clear all of it off. You simply build on top of it. Those sorts of ideas. And when we look at it, the concrete that they use to build it is as much as 22 feet thick in some places. So it's incredible and innovative. And when you look at the main structure, this main round rotunda here, you'll notice that it's spherical. It's not only circular in the floor plan, but you can easily put a sphere inside of it of roughly the same size. So it creates a structure that really attracts our eye, that really is very interesting to us. And you'll notice that there are cutouts on the inside of the dome. Those are called coffers. And what those do are, is lighten the structure. Just like with an airplane wing, you cut holes in the spars where you don't need extra structure to cut weight. They're doing exactly the same thing here inside of the dome. As we move inside, your eye is drawn immediately to the oculus, this massive opening at the top, which is the only source of light. And of course, it would be sort of seen as a divine light that would move around the pantheon throughout the year. Yes, it allows rain, etc. in, but there are drains that take care of that. The entire thing is covered then in veneer. That dome would have been covered in bronze. That is now in St. Peter's Basilica in the Baldacchino, created uh, in the current St. Peter's. But this would have all been covered in bronze originally. And this would have been, as I said, a highly symbolic interior. Now today, this structure has been converted to a church, and we see people buried at those various chapels, those various niches which used to contain gods, including the famous painter Raphael, uh, most famous for being one of the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> 